Yeah. Uh, yeah. Welcome everyone to myself, Derek Owusu, Korte Newland. We're just going to be talking about the Black British novel then and now. Um, I think first what we need to do is kind of try, try our hardest to define what we mean by a Black British novel. Because I know probably people probably saw that and thought, well, what are you talking about here? <laughs> so basically, it's, for, for this discussion, it's going to be people who define themselves as Black British. Um, it doesn't matter what they're writing about. As long as they define themselves as Black British, then we will, we will discuss their novels. But we will also take it back to, you know, writers like Sam Selvon, um, Beres Gilroy, um, who obviously were in the UK at the time, but may not have necessarily thought of themselves as Black British, but were writing novels that obviously influenced what would come later. Yeah. Um, I mean, is that is that a satisfactory definition for you, Courtier? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's great for me. And I think there is a distinction between the people who came before, who obviously maybe slightly became British, depending on whether they chose that or not. Some people never chose that. Some people are like, you know, I'm Caribbean or I'm African till, you know, the grave. And some people kind of said, okay, well, maybe I've become British. But even in that sense, I feel like uh, those people were never British in the way that someone like myself was. I don't know. Were you born in? Were you born here? Derek? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I was, I was, I was born in the UK. But I think, <clears throat> you know, it's like we were discussing earlier because you said, you know, you came from Labrick Grove. You grew up around a lot of people who you guys created a culture for yourself. Yes. Therefore, you identified with that. I think. Whereas me, obviously, even though I'm like I'm 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 younger, my identity is, is still a bit more slippery just because you know mm-hmm. when people for me anyway when people ask you know where you from I say Ghana yeah. even though I've I've been to Ghana once in my life you know I was born here raised here and everything do you see what I'm saying so yeah. the identity is a bit more it feels like it's a bit more slippery than it is for you from what you've explained to me yeah and I was I, I think you know we, we had a chat earlier just to explain to everybody else and I think from for myself I didn't start there I started off by I'm Caribbean I'm West Indian And then I suppose two things happened. The first thing that happened was that uh, I started to feel part of a culture that was starting to define itself in terms of being British. Mm -hmm. So uh, the British hip hop scene, people like London Posse, Demon Boys, people like that. But also there was a a slang and there was a um, culture coming up that wasn't necessarily, although it was, was completely wedded to the West Indies, it wasn't as wedded let's say my mum's culture was or my father's culture was, that was slightly more tied up to being there for, for obvious reasons because they came when they was young. Yeah. So that was the first thing that happened was that we started coming with this new thing, new slang, new way of talking that was very, very British. Yeah, a different energy. Different energy. And it was the yeah. energy that we see today. It was the first time people had seen. I remember people being like, you lot are different, man. The olders would be like, you lot are different. You just you mm. talk different, you act different. It's just slightly weird. But um, also the second thing that happened was that um, I went to the Caribbean. So when I was 16, I went to the Caribbean for the first time. And when I got there, people are saying to me, you're English, you're British. And it like, at first I was, I was annoyed, I was upset. And then I started to think, well, if I'm in the Caribbean and they're saying to me that I'm not Caribbean, then mm. rah, okay, so what is that? Yeah. And then I started to think about that a little bit more. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's interesting as well because you know, even though like I consider myself a uh, uh, black British, whenever I come across like um, uh, a kind of like a West Indian Cockney who's like serious Cockney, it always <laughs> takes me back a little bit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I'm like, rah, like you're you're really you're really, you're really out. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, course, I had like that. you're saying, that's that's how they were they became themselves. You know? Yeah, exactly. But this is the thing. It's like. It's weird because I think that when I was saying that we were defining our own space, I felt like it was like taking a bit, bit of the Cockney and a bit of the Caribbean and then fusing it to, to bring something that was really yeah. new. So like, like a hybrid, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it was, a, it was like, it was all of those things. It was like, you could be talking like Patois and then you'd be talking about scores and stuff, you know what I mean? And, and it just like, it went fluidly between the two things. And I wouldn't yeah. say that that's obviously not the first time it had happened, but it'd been the first time it happened in that way. And it was kind of yeah. unique. I mean, I remember 
talking certain slang and my mum saying, we used to say that when we were teenagers, you know what I mean? You lot ain't coming with nothing new. And mm. then but, but we had our new stuff as well. I could sit in a room on the phone to my friends and my mum be sitting there and not know what I was talking about, basically, because we had our this new style of slang. And that became the Britishness that I, the black Britishness that I see today. Right, okay. So what, what, was, what was the first black British novel that you read where you saw that reflected like what you're talking about now the hybridity of the language and the forming of the culture what was the first one you read where you you, you came across that I didn't see that specifically which is why I wrote the, no the novel The Scholar you know that's why I and I was the part of me was like okay I want to see that thing and what can I bring to the table as a novelist and stuff and uh yeah what could I do that was fresh but what I saw were things that were kind of like almost that, very, very close. Right. And I think um, the first novel that I read that was really, really close was um, Carleen Smith, Moss Side Massive. Okay, yeah, yeah. It wasn't the first Black British novel I wrote, I read, <laughs> yeah. but it was the first novel where I read it. I have like, that here for people interested, Moss Side Massive. She's very close. Yeah. She's very, very close. Like. Uh, but the difference for me was that she was in Manchester. And in some ways, as a guy who was just starting to write my first novel, oh. uh, I was like, thank God she wasn't in London. You know what I mean? Because if she was in London, that would have been what I was trying to do. And yeah. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do it first. Uh, but, but I read that and I was like, wow, this is close, man. Um, I, think, I think the first black British novel that I read, and I can't even really remember the title, uh, I would have been 12 or 13 and uh, it was called Rainbow Something and it must have been published about, I reckon about 85. Mm. Yeah, it was like uh, mid to late 80s because I was in school and my English teacher had brought it in. And um, yeah, it was, it was the first time I'd seen a black British character. Um, right. He was born here. He wasn't from, he hadn't come from somewhere else. I read lots of novels where people have come from somewhere else. That was the first time I saw uh, a novel about someone who was born here. Right, okay. So so at what point did you read, um, I think it's uh, Norman Samunda Smith, he's Bad Friday. So what point did you read that? Because obviously, um, as we know, and I think it is confirmed that he was like the first yeah. black British writer born in Britain to be published. Yeah. Like I said, that novel I, I, I read, the first yeah. time I saw it, I know that was 85 at some time. And uh, Norman Samunda Smith was 82. Um, and I read... That novel, um, oh, I read yeah. that novel it's when a I, Bad Friday, yeah, no more Friday, really, yeah. really good book. I read that novel when when I was um, writing the scholar, so I would have been twenty one. No, I would have been twenty at that time. So that's the first time I read that, and I went to my friend's house and her dad, who was a, a dread from Birmingham. He just kept giving me books. Once he found out I was writing a book, he kept giving me books, and he gave mm -hmm. me Norman Samantha Smith, Bad Friday, and he gave me. Uh, Rudolf Kaiserman. Um, I'm here and I can't even show you the other one because, well, I can show it to you, but I have a signed copy, but the cover went. Yeah. Uh, Stand Up in the World. And you that, need to give that to me. I need to borrow that from you still. Yeah, yeah. But you get off <laughs> it, bro. <laughs> I mean, this is like uh, 1965, this came out. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, so from that's Norman Simon Smith story to go back to him, Bad Friday. That, that, is defined as the, the first black British novel written by a guy that was born in this country and was talking about black culture in this country. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that I mean that that's what that's what he said. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that as far as I know, that that's the first one. And I read that and that was set in Birmingham, I think. Mm. And um, but because it was in the 80s, it didn't have a lot of the slang. It was 82, so, it, so I think probably at 82, although there was a slang, obviously, you know, it wasn't the slang that was that later developed, that it's become like ubiquitous mm. across the whole country, you know, that you get me, mm. and this and that, you know, like the way that kind of like kids in inner cities talk now, that wasn't there yet. Uh, right. but, it was, but it was, again, very, very close. So what I want to ask you, now that you, you, you've mentioned slang, do you feel like the inclusion of kind of like 
I guess, slang and colloquialisms in literature that's based in, in like a black British London. Do you feel like that adds to some sort of authenticity when it comes to the novel? Um, yeah, it depends on who's doing it, right? <laughs> right, okay. You know, inauthentic slang, um, you can have slang that doesn't work. I read a, a lot of novels around the time when I was starting out again, um, maybe like mid nineties where people were trying to do it. There were, there were lots of attempts mm -hmm. by lots of different people to try and write, you know, street, uh, uh, inner city, working class, black fiction. It's quite interesting why there were so many attempts at doing this. So maybe because of the hip hop, the music and whatever, but you know, loads of people were trying to write this into literature. And in my humble opinion, uh, not quite getting there in terms of being able to reflect the 360 degrees, like for me, the emotion of the characters, mm. you know, the psychological integrity, uh, the dialogue as well had to be on point for me. And also like the ren rendering of environment, like like having a, what in film filmic terms you call a precinct, you know, the precinct mm. being really strong and vivid, like in the wire, you know, it's Baltimore, it's very distinctive, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so to have that as well, for me, those, those are like the criteria. So, um, so where, where, where do you put then um, Sam Selvon's The Lonely Londoners in terms of its use of, I mean, obviously you weren't around them times, but, you know, being, <laughs> being, being, being West Indian, I'm sure sometimes you, you can hear something and just know that doesn't, that just doesn't sound right. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, totally. It happens all the time. But I mean, like, like with Selvon, that was like, you know, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, as far as I was concerned, for all of those things. And uh, I read Sam Selva when I was 19. And at the time, I'd been writing a, uh, like a Windrush novel. My first novel was a Windrush novel. I don't know if I say this very much. And it's called The Brothers Grimm. So, and it was based on the stories of the, the old boy across the road from my house who used to cut my hair, John T. And uh, it was based on my granddad's stories. And then um, I read Sam Selva's The Lonely Londoners. And I was just like, it's done, isn't it? You know what I mean? It's done. It's like, I don't like, how can I be trying to do this now in, in like the nineties and this guy did it and was there at the time. And it's so real. And all the stories that my granddad told me, they're there, you know what I mean? They're in the book. So I knew it was authentic. And then you know, being around my granddad and his friends and stuff, I could feel the authenticity. So that was that really, that was my book binned. You know, I, mean, I was just like, there's no way I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. not gonna even make the attempt. I mean. I'd maybe been an older writer, I'd try to find a way around that. But at the time I just wanted to, you know, you want to be, you want to, you want to revolutionize the novel, you know? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I then started thinking about what it was that I could do. And that led me to think about what was going on around me and the language that I used and the fact that Selwyn had done the same streets that I wanted to talk about as well was really brilliant for me. And I, I had a blueprint in just from a different era. So I was like, okay, mm. well, what if I did that like now? What would that look like? And that's yeah, yeah. part of me on the road. Interesting. So, you know, like in the early 90s when um, I guess Black British books focusing on kind of like council estates or, or, or ends as we call it, became kind of more popular. Would you, would you say that if Lonely Londoners was published in the 90s, it would have been, it would have been pigeonholed into like an urban novel? Uh, it could have been. I think probably not. I think probably not because it didn't have the kind of things that urban novels, novels concern themselves with. And or, or the biggest thing, which was crime, really. You know, it didn't have that element in it. So um, it would have been, it would have been something else, I think. And it's funny, you know, we were talking earlier, we were talking about uh, Alex's book, we talk about uh, Brixton Rock and Easter Baker Lane is saying a kind of, it, they, they tend not to be described in that, that kind of urban fiction bracket in the same way, I think. And I think because those, the themes of the stories and stuff, even though obviously there are, there is crime in those books, they're not really described as crime books. I think there, there's a kind of, um, that kind of psychological integrity we talked about earlier that, that, that also you can find in a book like Lonely Londoners. Yeah. Uh, so, so, I actually think probably not. I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Yeah, it's 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 an interesting one. You know, I've had conversations with um with friends, and they would 
they were kind of like, no, this is this is hood lit. This is what they call it. They're like, no, this is hood lit because of what Selvon's talking about, and mm -hmm. I guess kind of like the the interactions of people obviously living in working class areas. Yeah, yeah. That's that's usually a criteria for labeling a book as, as urban literature and yeah. and so on. Do you know what I mean? And although there's no kind of like overt crime and like gun crime and all these kind of things, yeah. there are kind of like it's the scene things that life. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's yeah, it's, it is interesting. And like you're saying, it's interesting what I guess kind of like why I call the, the tastemakers or, 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 or whatever, they consider what is urban lit and know what is what is literature, what's real literature. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Which books cool. get relegated where? Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I remember having a conversation with Linton Crazy Johnson and the, the great thing about Linton is you can ask him questions about things like that. And, and, and he knows because he was there. And uh, mm. I asked him, um, you know, how was Lonely Londoners received at the time? What did people think about that novel at the time? And, mm. and I bet certain people didn't like the fact that he was using vernacular and stuff like that. So certain people might have thought it was, uh, it lacked, uh, you know, literary uh, prowess to, to, to talk in that way. Use, Which is bizarre uh, because these, these same people were Ray Chaucer. Yeah, exactly. you know I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, exactly. Well, we all know how people view, you know, patois and stuff, and how you know yeah. language and stuff. So, um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I asked that at Linton, and he said, "Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. You know, like people, it wasn't really. People did look down on it at the time. People did think it was kind of not true literature, and that's pervasive. You know, whatever era we look at, where you're dealing with these tropes and you know traits." In the novels, people will say, "Okay, that's not the way that literature should be done." You know, they, yeah. it's not, it's not high literature. It's kind of lowbrow. It's down there. Right, right, right. Yeah, I feel you. So, in, in terms of like tropes that are, are, are dealt with, like obviously now, you know, a lot of like the Black British novels that I'm reading are dealing with like identity and and belonging and and and, and things like that. Was there any kind of trope that was really prevalent when you when you were writing the scholar um yeah i mean i think it was that 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 it was that it was that trope it was like identity was very much what people were writing about i suppose trying to define what it means to be black and british was you know, the primary focus of most of the novels and it has been for a long time you know i mean i think i think some people would argue that that's what lonely londoners is about or, or, you know, George Lamming's uh, early novels were about. And, you know, I, I think definitely, uh, like I said, no cover, but stand up in the world, you know, that's what's going on for him. He is trying to define who he is. He's like, oh, you know, I'm not quite Caribbean. I'm not quite from the Caribbean community. And I'm not these um, rich, posh white people. His girlfriend's white and this a rich, posh white woman. And, and, you know, I'm not those people. I don't fit in there either. So where do I fit in? And where do I belong? Yeah, yeah. Who am I? You know, those questions. So. I think that's that's been ongoing. I don't know when that started, but that's been an ongoing kind of pervasive trope for quite a while. Right. Okay. I know. I know. Duran Adibayo, his book kind of deals with those kind of, and he published yeah. around the same time as you as well, didn't he? Yeah, I think he was like a year or so before or something like that. From what I remember, but yeah, yeah, he he dealt with that in some kind of black. You know, it was it was trying to, but also like you know, coming of age stories. Most you know, people who write first novels, write coming of age stories, you know? Um, and, and so, so yeah, it, it's, there's a sense of that in, in, in most first novels, you know, most first coming of age stories, but with, obviously with Black British books, it's tied up with race and trying to define yourself in a culture where you're not the host, you know, society, you're not part of the host society. Yeah, yeah. So, so when, when, when you were writing, do you feel like there was more variety in terms of subjects from Black British novelists compared to now? Um, I think there was an attempt at that. People first started writing the stories that were close to them and then you had a section of writers that were trying to break new ground. So you had like uh, Pete Callu, who uh, started writing sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, I think like mid 90s, I don't know exactly 
when that was. I don't know if anyone knows out there when Pete Kelly started writing uh, Black Star Rising, I think it was, and books like that. But he, I saw, you know, the, and then there was that, and then you had, you know, the, like the baby fathers that were writing like you know, comedy, and then you had, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I've yeah. got that right here. Yeah, yeah. You had the comedy <laughs> novels, and then you had the, you know, the, the crime novels like Yardy, and you had like Rocky Carr and Trevor Hercules. You know, you had those mm. guys, and mm. then um, you had like um, you had uh, Leone was around at that time. I think you know, you know, all the blood is red, and you had people writing novels like that. Um, I, I think Bernadine was around at that time. Uh, with Lara, I think it was around that time as well. So you, you had you had a, a wide range, and I think if it had continued, like in the way it was going, mm. then maybe we'd have, we'd have seen like a, a big second wave in the early uh, two thousands and stuff. But but actually things contracted and things got smaller and less people got published, and it seemed like it had been a fashion, and then all too quickly it kind of like not completely died, but 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 nearly been snuffed out. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you, was, you when we spoke earlier, you were saying that it often sounds like it was better back in the day in terms of Black British writers being published. I mean, I don't know if for our era, but if we if we really if we uh, widen the definition of Black British writers for a minute, you know, yeah. um, looking at this book, uh, you know, Other Britain, Other British by Robert Lee. Uh, mm. I got this in Black Book Swap, Trisha's uh, really great festival. And um, this is an essay in that called The Disturbing Vision of George Lamin. And I, I like to read straight from the book because I don't want to paraphrase and get it wrong. Yeah, the go for it. Yeah. Which is accurate. But he said, uh, in the three decades that followed the Second World War, it was West Indians in England who established the fastest growing branch of the new literatures in English that were developing out of the old Commonwealth nations. In the 15 years from 1952 to 1967 alone, West Indians published some 137 novels beside a considerable volume of short stories, poems, and plays. 137. So if you look at that in that you know, late 60s, mid to late 60s, and you look at like now, we haven't got anything comparable to that, I think. So I think that speaks for itself. And I know uh, Trevor Etienne would say in uh, television and film, the same could be said, you know, there were more things being produced in those days than there are now. And yeah, I mean, like I said, that's a, a, a looser definition of Black British than, than you, know, you, you know, you first uh, spoke about. But mm -hmm. in the sense that it was, people who come over from the Caribbean and they were black people and they were making culture, literature and film in Britain, there was more of it, you know, so. Uh, yeah, was, I mean, I mean, I, 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 at, that, at that point, it doesn't really matter what they define themselves at. It just matters that they were being published, like, do you know what I'm saying? So what, what, what do you think happened? What do you think changed? Um, it's hard to say. I, was saying, I mean, I think the 80s happened, the manufacture, you know, I mean, that definitely, okay, yeah. yeah, you know, I saw, I saw a lot of um, arts council funding that had been available at that time, and I'm young at this time, so I don't know the ins and outs, I'm sure there's people out there who saw it firsthand and know, know a lot more than me, but just as a kid, what I saw was things that were available just being shut down, uh, festivals that used to take place not happening anymore, you know, uh, the mm. GLC not happening anymore, you know, things that I used to be able to go to at a certain point in my life stopped happening. And mm. um, it seemed like it was due to, you know, conservative policies. Um, so, so I think that happened. I also happen to think that, that like in those days as well, people were quite self-sufficient in the sense that they didn't believe that the mainstream was going to give them anything anyway in the same way that we had you know, blues dances and blues parties, you know, like people did that because they weren't being catered for by the mainstream clubs. I think it was the same for, you know, mm. other aspects of our arts as well. So our literature and stuff. I mean, this uh, Stand Up in the World is published by Blackbird Books, 5 Caledonian Road, London N7. You know what I mean, so yeah, that sounds like an indie to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. 
where it sounds like an indie to me. Yeah. So there was a lot of that going on. And I think that, um, I don't know, yeah, maybe funding got pulled, you know, economically, it wasn't a great time in the 80s and stuff. And then, like, mm -hmm. you know, money started to disperse and stuff, and there was a lot less art. That's what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I want to talk to you um, just quickly about, I guess, kind of like the, the class divide. I don't want to call it divide, but, but that's, that's the best word I can, I can come up with in terms of Black British Lit, in terms of how we see particular kind of books compared to, to other books. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What gets considered literature and, and, and what doesn't? So, you know, I just, I sent you a, um, an article about Two Fingers, who uh, was published, when was he published? 19, 95? I think it was 95, yeah. So yeah, like, yeah. I, I was reading Two Fingers books again when I, would, when I was thinking about writing The Scholar, when I was thinking about becoming a writer. These books were already on the scene, yeah. And, and this was considered like the first, the first jungle novel. Yeah, yeah, he wrote a novel uh, with someone else. I can't remember the co-writer's name, but uh, he wrote a novel called Junglist. And there were two novels, there was Junglist and there was another novel I can't remember. And it was the same thing, it was like inner city, working class, black Britain, and he was trying to uh, bring to light a, a subculture, a British subculture, mm -hmm. it was new and fresh and it was exciting and he was trying to capture it as it was happening. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then obviously the article goes on to say, no one would ever consider this real literature. Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's kind of like, what, what, is the, what is the criteria for that? Because when I first, read those words i immediately the first person who came to mind was um the american writer charles bukowski yeah, yeah. who is a for, he's a terrible writer but mm -hmm. he's still considered literature do you see what i'm saying yeah. whereas it's kind of like when it comes to i guess a black writer writing about particular things mm -hmm. it's not considered literature it's considered urban literature it's the same thing that happened to sister soldier yeah, yeah. um with, with Midnight, do you know what I mean? Which is an incredible book, but they, they relegated it to urban literature. Like yeah. this isn't really art, yeah. do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it is, it's interesting to see which, which, which books they choose, what goes where. It is strange, it is strange. And uh, you know, I was a bit, you know, I didn't know that people had been saying that about uh, Two Fingers, or maybe I had at the time and I'd forgotten about it. So when you sent me the article and I read that, I was like, wow, he actually, Lately, came out and said, "This is not literature. Yeah, yeah. This is not good literature." That's a, I don't know what he was saying. So, and I, I think we need to be really wary and really careful about casting those distinctions. You know, I mean, obviously, there's a difference between good writing and bad writing. But I, 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 I I've always myself tried not to define myself by genre, and um, to not define others by genre. So, yeah. so. Yeah, I, I, all I care is whether people are telling a good story or not, or whether they can write. And so this this idea that because people write, say, commercial fiction, or they write, you know, romance fiction, or what, you know, any other fiction, you know, urban fiction, although I hate that title as well, you know, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, inner city writing, um, and and can be like not literary because they're they're writing these things is just crazy. And another thing I feel like you know I I was on a I was on a show talking about this uh, with Drita Say Mitchell and uh, oh, I don't know who it was, um, it'll come back to me. But yeah, we were talking about this idea of a black British canon. And I think, I think Drita was really against a canon because she said it means that people will be shut out. You know, you will be saying, okay, this is good literature. This is what gets right, through. Right, right. And all of those people aren't good literature and they need to stay out. And being a crime writer, I can see where she was coming from, you know what I mean? Because you hear that all the time about crime writing. And yeah. Um, yeah. it has to be said that Bukowski as well, like, you know, people do consider Bukowski not literature as well. In some circles, you know, there are circles that, that think that. Okay. But, but I think for me, any canon that we had in, in, have in Britain, basically, and I don't know if this sounds crazy, see what you think about this, but basically should just include everybody. So the canon mm -hmm. is, whatever we publish whatever is put out by a person who is black and is british we don't mm. get to tell people you're in or out of the canon because everything is an expression of who we are and everything mm. is the art that we're creating while we're here on this planet right here in this time 
So mm -hmm. everything serves a purpose in terms of communicating who we are to anybody who wants to pick up the book and read it. So it should all be considered, basically. See, that's 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 interesting. I've I've, I've had this argument a lot with some of my friends. Um, you know, my my friend Simeon Brown set up a book club specifically for this purpose to kind of argue what is part of the Black British canon and what isn't. Yeah. And um, so what I wanted to ask you then is kind of like, you know, when a new book comes out by a Black British author um, and it's sent to you and they're like, could you please provide a blurb? You read it, you don't, you're not feeling with it. You don't connect with the book. You don't, you know, you don't rate it, I guess. Um, what do you do in that situation? Do you say to yourself, you know what, this is a young black British writer or, or this is a black British writer of any age. They're trying to get into the game. I can't enter them. Or do you say, I can't endorse this because I'm not feeling it? Um, I try not to, um, I try not to do that. If I can't endorse something, it's because I don't have the time to read it properly, uh, to endorse something okay. rather than whether I like it or not. I don't, think that my opinion actually is that important in the sense that I like what Fair I like, right? You know what I mean? I like what I like. I'm one person. Mm. I, who mm. am I to speak for everybody? I can't speak for everybody actually, you know what I mean? There's people, there's books yeah. that I do not like that people will fight for, you know what I mean? And argue to the early morning about the merits of that particular book. And that's fine. What I mm. say when I read a book that I don't particularly care for myself is that book isn't for me it's just not my thing but it might be somebody else's thing and you know right. i think you know my my position has changed a little bit i think i think when i was starting out i was being like that's not a good book and there's this that and the other da, 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 da. And then, but then it's funny sometimes i've said that about books and then i go back and i pick them up later and i'm like wow okay i missed that and i missed that yeah i missed yeah. that and i started to read less as I got more and more into the game I started to read less as a um a reader and an audience member and more as a writer and for me reading as a writer I can always pick up something from somebody I can always learn something I can always see oh well they did this kind of cool and and, and mm. I become I'm studying it on a, on a craft level sometimes on a lack of craft level but still that's still telling me something that's communicating something to me and so mm. um yeah I try not to make that distinction now so much. I mean, of course, there are books that I don't like, but that's just me. That's just not for me. I wouldn't say, okay, so that book shouldn't be included in a canon because it's not good enough. It doesn't meet this, this, this criteria that I've set. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. right, yeah. I don't think. You know, I, I, yeah, I actually, I agree with you. I do agree with you. I think, you know, Sometimes you get you do get caught up in the whole kind of good reader sort of thing. It's like, oh, this book's whack. This isn't. Do you know what I mean? And I think when you do become a writer, or you know, when you start thinking in, in that kind of way, it just becomes a bit more. Okay, you know what? This is very harsh. Yeah, it's yeah. very harsh to talk about. Right? Especially yeah. a, a black British writer. You know, especially when the the playing field is not level. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm 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 sure on the other side of the coin, there are like white writers who get sent books they'll read a couple of pages. It reminds me of, you know, George Orwell's, he's got an essay where he's talking about when he was reviewing books, he would read 10 pages and review the book. Yeah, it doesn't read the entire book. <laughs> and I'm sure that that happens, <laughs> you see know what I'm saying? I'm sure that that happens and then they, they just yeah. give them a really good endorsement because, oh, you know, they're cool peoples or whatever. Yeah, do you yeah. see what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, a lot no, of no, you are done right. by, you know, like who, what the reputation of the author is, who the publishing house is, things like that, you know? And, uh, yeah, I, I try and kind of shed that myself. I mean, even for me, like, yeah. I've changed a lot as a, as a reader. I used to be like the, the 10 pages and, and now I'm not feeling that reader and stuff. And until a couple of books, I had to read further because, say, I was on holiday and I'd exhausted all of my, you know, my book reading for that holiday. And there was only the book left that I'd said, nah, and I put it down and I'd read a few pages and I said that wasn't suitable. And then I've gone back to it and read it and it's like, oh my God, this book is a masterpiece. You know what I mean? It's that it just doesn't operate in the way that I think books should operate. It does its own thing. It does something else, you know? And I started to be open to that a lot more. And as I started to be open to that a lot more, I made a lot more discoveries. And, and, and 
fiction became almost like a playground for me. You know, I could be like, okay, well, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to learn things. I'm going to get excited by things that are not just, um, you know, my rigid criteria of what a book should do. Mm -hmm. Now I'm more open and I'm just like, all right, well, do what you do. You tell me what you do. And even just, uh, you know, just to end, I mean, when I'm working with writers, especially when I'm mentoring writers and stuff, I will try and find out what the writer wants to do rather than dictate to them what they should do. And then my goal is to try and help them do that. It's not to help them become, to, to write like me. It's, it's to yeah, write yeah. like themselves, you know? Yeah, yeah. So speaking of you, you mentoring, you know, young writers, young Black British writers, you said something interesting when I was speaking to you before was that if you come across a writer who you feel like is writing for a white audience, you will say, why are you doing that? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so in, 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 so from that, I want to ask you, do you feel like the books from when you were writing up until now, mm -hmm. do you think that that's been a common theme where it's kind of like you're, white, you're writing for a white audience or was it less so then, more so now, less so now, more so then? Mm, that's a hard question. I think, I think, because I think up until a certain point, we all are or have been writing for a white audience to a greater or lesser degree. Mm. Uh, whether we're aware of that or not. It's funny, when you talk about the, the classroom settings and stuff, I found it quite interesting because it's caused a lot of problems, you know. I've said to people, uh, well, you know, you're writing for a, a white audience. And they're like, first, they don't realise. They're like, what do you mean? Like, well, how am I? I don't understand. What, like, how am I writing? I'm like, well, in this scene here, when you describe, say, how someone makes roti, like, would you say that to another Indian person? You know what I mean? Mm -mm -mm. No, well, of course I wouldn't. Da, 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 because you have to explain this, that, and the other. And I'm like, well, so, so why are you doing that? Why are you assuming that your audience doesn't know how to make roti, you know? Is that an integral part of your story? Is that something that, that, that is going to come up in terms of character or plot? I'm always like, you know, it's like a push and pull when you're writing stories between character and plot. If you're not doing things that, that concern those two things, then, you know, you're not really writing. And so, um, yeah, I question that sometimes. And people are shocked. They're like, sometimes people have got upset about that. Sometimes people, I've had people like literally storm out of my class. Like, How can you be saying that or whatever? But then email me years later. Oh, wow. like, Actually, I'm really sorry for stomping out of your class all those years ago. I've had it made me look at what I was mm. doing and analyze what was going on and stuff, and then realizing there was something in that. I was talking to a perceived audience that was outside of myself. And there's lots of you know essays being written about this from, from, from way back. My thing is look, when I see a white writer describe to me how to make fish and chips, then I'll buy it. You know what I mean? Then I'll be like, okay, that, I, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all right. That, but until that day where I see a yeah, guy yeah, break yeah. down or mix, how to make a cup of tea. So I put the tea bag in and then I put the sugar and then I let it, da, 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 when I see mm -hmm. that, okay, then yeah, we, we start talking like that about how to make roti and dumplings and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's what I'm, I must say. When I was, when I was writing, that reminds me and I was writing scenes that were specific to kind of like Ghanaian British uh, culture in you know in the UK I was thinking more about Ghanaians like I was thinking about Ghanaians when I was writing that do you know what I mean I was thinking oh my god I hope I hope, I hope they rate this do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. that was going through my that's what was that was worrying me yeah. um so I think I am very very glad that I wasn't thinking about a white audience when I was writing this and of course as well I, I imagine so many black British writers have been through this where you write something, goes to an editor. One editor understands, but then it goes to another editor, and they're like, "What? What? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. um, can Can you explain this?" Yeah. I remember I um, I wrote the term "raw," like you know, obviously like "raw," like I'm surprised. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that reminds me, and one editor took the "a" out and just wrote "rh," yeah. because he probably <laughs> thought that made more sense than. than hey, what was, what Do you know what I mean? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so yeah, little, little, little things like that. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, definitely. I think, I think like, 
context is really good and if you can provide context without like using too much exposition that's fine but when you're having to explain say if you had to write this is what raw means and stuff you had a breakdown of what raw means and where it comes from and stuff like that 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 for me takes you out of the novel that becomes something else you're not with the character stuff you're not moving forwards in motion mm. so uh, that for me is when things become a problem if you're slowing down um, the character or the plot movement then 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 you need to start thinking about why you're doing that and, and like and who is it for really and um i think your, your audience has to be broad i'm not saying you, you say okay i'm i'm sick get all those people who might not understand this and stuff you know what i mean like so i know when i was writing the scholar i was very careful about slang you know i didn't use obviously a certain level of slang when like my mom doesn't understand what I'm talking about, you know. I was like, okay, if I use a certain uh, a certain bank of words, you know, like, and I use them over and over again, then people might start to understand them. But right? so if I call one thing one slang, I won't use another slang word for it, you know. What I mean, and I'll keep that going throughout the book. So people oh, right, okay. just that specific word. So um, I'm not yeah. trying to confuse people, you know. What I mean, I'm not trying to be like obtuse, but I, I think. Uh, there's this thing when you're explaining too much, you know what I mean? Or you're, or you're writing for an audience that are not, are not specifically going to um, understand these things, you know, having to slow down what you're saying in order to explain things. I think that then it becomes a problem. And yeah. just some- See, and that's it, interesting that you say, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's interesting that you say you won't, if you use one slang for one, one thing, you won't use another word. That automatically brings to mind, um, only fools and horses, where they sprinkled Cockney rhyming slang in everything, yeah, and they didn't explain anything at all, yeah, yeah. Totally. and they were confident enough to do that. Do you know what I mean? Why do you not feel like you're confident enough to yeah. call? You know, do you know what I mean? Use yeah, two exactly. words for the same thing and not yeah. allow context to well, explain was, to the reader. This is what I'm saying. Even though I was writing for a black audience, I was still very, very aware the likelihood is that there's going to be an audience who doesn't get it. And that's fine. So when that, I say, even in the beginning and stuff, I was, uh, I had that awareness. I had this thing where, okay, as much as I, I'm doing it for, I'm writing, it's close to a novel for the mandem that I can, I can do. Also, I'm like, okay, it is a form of translation. It is a, it's not the whole, I'm not going hard on it, you know? And even up to this day, I've had I've had situations with that, you know, like uh, film scripts and stuff where people are like, I don't get the patois, I can't follow the patois. Can you make the patois accessible for me? So that's a very and that's a very um, realistic thing that I think a lot of writers go through. And I think um, mm -hmm. what happens where, where if you're doing that too much, the reason it's a problem, just to explain to everyone, is that then you start to water down, you know, the the. Uh, the similitude of the characters, you know, the authenticity of the characters. If you start then having them behave in a way that isn't quite what they, the way that they would behave, basically. So I think I made compromises, you know. No, I wanted to follow definitely. Yeah. Even my my aunt. My I want to. I want to. I want to go from there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, you yeah. go through. Go through. No, no, I was just saying, one of my aunts was saying I didn't compromise enough, but that's, that's another story. But yeah, so it depends on who you're talking to, obviously, as well. All right, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, what I wanted to say was that um, I wanted to now take it away from, obviously, that that kind of literature and, and mm -hmm. in terms of Black British writing and about Black British writers who write about the past, who write about, I guess, kind of like the enslaved era or in a country that was colonized or that's you know kind of messed up by imperialism so you know for for me personally i think right now you know we have um sarah collins yeah. you know who wrote you know um franny langton and then we have another book i'm annoyed that i cannot remember but i know it's based in brixton it's, and it's based yeah. on the brixton rise but i can't remember i think it's called the book of echoes the book of echoes now i'm ready with yeah when you when you were writing it I've, I've read Fanny Langton. I haven't read the Book of Echoes yet. I haven't both. Um, when you were writing, was that something that was happening a lot where people would draw from the past, Black British writers draw from the past in order to tell a story? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, Carol Phillips did it. He, he'd done it. Um, 
I think uh, David Dabadeen done it, I think. Um, oh yeah, that, I think it's called a Harlot's Progress. Yeah, I think, I so think that's what it's it, called. David and Fred, Fred Dwyer as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Lots, lots of people have, have written those, those narratives. And I remember, I can't remember the name of the story, but it was a Carol Phillips story uh, high, in Higher Ground. It was the first story in Higher Ground. And it was the story about uh, a guy, uh, an a African guy in Africa who was basically selling slaves to the slavers. You know, it's a story about that, you know, so uh, which I'd never seen before. I was like, wow, someone actually went there, you know what I mean? And actually brave enough to go and do that. And it was a great story. It was a really, really good story. And um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely uh, people are doing that. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, part of our, it's part of our legacy to tell those stories as well. Those stories are definitely up for grabs. For me, my, my concern with it as a writer and as a reader is just, you know, how can it be done differently? How can we do something new? And from what I've seen, like, you know, Franny Langton is something new, uh, Book of Echoes is something new. So, so yeah, it's just how, how can this be, you know, like, like, like done in a fresh way that reinvigorates the, the, the subject matter? Mm -hmm. And but but how would you do that? I'm just I'm interested now because I'm I'm just kind of how would you write it in a fresh way? I think the book of Echoes, reading the synopsis, is definitely done in in, yeah, in a fresh yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. Um, but how how else how else can we do that? I'm I'm not asking you to pitch me a novel right oh, now. Oh, yeah. um, no, no, you know what? I didn't realize I was still here. It just told my computer just told me I've been signed out. So. If you can still see me, that's great. But I can't see you guys anymore. But you know what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Still yeah, what I was, oh, I'm back. Yeah, great. What I was going to say to you was, um, I can't tell you. <laughs> because I have my, I, I have my idea on <laughs> right. how to do it differently, but I'm not. I'm I, thought you, I thought you were sitting there, I thought you were sitting there coming up with an idea, like, on no, the spot. No, no, I got the idea. I got my idea, you know what I mean? But, uh, yeah, that's, that's one that I've parked off for uh, later on down the line. It's a novel that right, I right, right. write at some point. I definitely want to get into some historical fiction, definitely, uh, because mm, that's what I'm showing mm. this writer, it's just rich for me. But it's just, uh, I've, got, I've got my idea mm. of my own. But it's just looking into the, the, the cracks and crevices of our, of our history, man, and looking at the places where you say, okay, uh, that hasn't been done before. And one of the brilliant things about being a black British writer is so many things haven't been done before. You know, you've got like you've got this fertile ground to take the, the stories and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I I looked at something and I was like, oh, I wonder if da, da, da. And I did a little bit of research and just like, yeah, yeah, that mm. actually did happen. That hasn't been covered. So, so that that's where I would go, go in that direction. I mean, right, um, okay. yeah, I I feel, I feel. Sorry, go on. No, sorry, go. You go ahead. No, I was going to say. Um, yeah, I feel like that too, you know, when I, when I was writing, that reminds me, I was thinking, I've never read a novel that really deals with, um, one, the trauma of foster care, yeah. which was farming, which is widespread, but we weren't talking about it up until recently. But then I thought, I've, I've never really read um, a novel by a Black British writer that um, deals with, um, I guess, kind of like psychology and, and, and mental health. Yeah. But obviously, this is, this is, this is a flaw in, in, a lot of our thinking that we think it's never been done before because then obviously exactly. i've now read a book you know right black right <laughs> british and they've they've pointed to leone ross's you know orange laughter and it's like this yeah, has right. been like people have explored this before do you know what i mean and i feel, I was I feel that. stupid I was but it's kind of like <laughs> do, you, do you see what i'm saying yeah totally yeah and we, yeah. we keep trying to reinvent the wheel sometimes some not all the time but sometimes we mm. get lucky and we do find something that's new but we do keep trying to reinvent the wheel uh not knowing that people have done it. And I was thinking of Valerie Mason John's novel uh, that deals with, I think it deals with foster care. I'm pretty sure it does. Uh, I can't remember the title of it. Sorry, guys. I, I don't have my books around me, so I can't, usually I'd be able to go to the, the shelf and just say uh, Valerie Mason John. But uh, mm. yeah, she, she did write a novel about foster care, I'm pretty sure. And so, um, yeah, that sometimes you... you like me with, with Sam Selwyn, discovering Sam Selwyn, be like, I'm going to write this novel and it's going to be this, that and the other. And then I, you know, yeah. if someone gives me Sam Selwyn, I'm like, oh, it's been done. So I you think, think I think I was going to really, say, sorry. No, no, I think that's just going to say, I think what we really need is just, uh, 
You know, we need a, a wider dissemination of the books that we have. I mean, one of the things I was going to say when, when I read that uh, piece earlier about 137 books is that the majority of those books are lost. Can you believe that? The majority of those mm. books are lost books. Um, so, so that's a huge wealth of knowledge there that's just gone. And uh, I don't know how we would try and find out what those books were, but I think it's really important for us as if we're talking about canons and we're talking about Black British literature as a now like sustainable, viable art form, and of course it has been for a long time, but, but going forwards, like who was doing what and how were they doing it? You know, I bet there's some classics there that, that we haven't seen. And even going back to the well, 90s, there's lost books. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 of course. Like when, um, after talking to you and you're giving me like that long list of um, black, uh, black British novels, a lot of them were really hard to find. Like yeah, exactly. most of them were out of print, so, you know, it says currently unavailable on Amazon, but you know it's never coming back. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you just have to give up. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do kind of wonder if, if that's going to happen to a lot of the books like from your era up until mine that have come out that in like 25 years time no one no one's going to know about these books they're going to have to be really like digging into some archives to find them yeah. and i just wonder why that happens well what what can we do to kind of preserve these books uh i think we need to start talking about them ourselves as writers and readers we need to start discovering these books and championing them you know like screaming from the rooftops that these books actually do matter you know as much as uh, our lives matter our stories matter as well and so we really need to be saying this to people and i'm not saying not as a as an, as an appeal for our humanity you know what i mean i'm talking about to each other you know yeah. saying to each other uh these books matter these are important that's why i feel great to give you a list of books and say these are the books that i remember these are the books that I think can feed you and you need to know about these books. And, um, you know, and, and just keep that going. Uh, and, and we need to, uh, I mean, I say this all the time, talk about each other literally in every interview. Every interview, you know, right. you say, okay, so right. there was this book and I referenced this book and that book and da, 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 and these are the people that I read. I got fed up in, in when I first came on the scene of hearing uh, black writers, black British writers, uh, give interviews and, and, and name check American writers and not name check any British people, you know what I mean? And say, oh, what are you into? No, no, no. And they've never name checked British people. So I think that's a practice yeah. that we have to keep going because that's what yeah. helps sustain the culture. Yeah, yeah. That, that's something that I really started thinking about myself as well. I think like, I think it was maybe like two years ago, no, three years ago, when I really started getting into black British literature and I thought to myself, you know what? In every interview, I need to name check Robin Travis. You know, mm -hmm. I need to talk about Alex Wheatle. I need to, you know, I need to talk mm -hmm. about the and I need to talk about these people um, and just use them as my point of references, like instead of like F. Scott Fitzgerald or <laughs> something yeah. like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? People do that a lot. Yeah, yeah. They're like, mm. anyway, you know that. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You know I mean, and that's exactly again, the same thing that we were talking about earlier. You know what? It does happen now a lot more. I see that a lot now. Uh, that people are starting to name check other Black British authors, and that's a great thing. So I'm glad to see it's changed. I think when I came on the scene, I was a little bit like, oh wow, this is interesting. You know, no one's talking about the other people that are, that are, that are doing things for whatever reasons, um, or even the old stuff that came before. You know, um, I was going to ask you actually something. Uh, I, I just in terms of like what you were reading when you wrote that reminds me. What was your what were your blueprints and stuff like? Who, who, who were you looking at from wherever? Yeah, so for, for, for that reminds me, I guess I was kind of looking at, um, there's an American writer called Jennifer Clements. She wrote a book called Widow Basquiat. And I read that and I was like really blown away by it, by this, the structure of it. And, but I think what really made me realize that I could write a novel in verse was reading Yosa Daly Ward's memoir, The Terrible. Yeah, yeah. I read that and I was just like, like this is it this is this is what i want to do i want to write like this do you see what i'm saying um so that, that that was really my inspiration and claudia rankin's um not citizen uh don't let me be lonely okay yeah i read that as well and and yeah but I, again like i said I, I really wish that um you know someone gave me leonie ross's um orange laughter yeah, yeah i wish yeah. that someone had done that do you know because then that's another influence for me as well and I, I like being influenced by other writers. It's not, it's not a point where 
Yeah. I want to pretend like, no, this is an original idea. I love standing on the shoulders of giants. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh. um, so, go on. Now, just another one, just for everyone out there. I know, I know we spoke about this before, but I don't want to let this whole session pass without me uh, mentioning her. But also, uh, in the same vein of what you're talking about, Joan Riley's uh, Unbelonging, I think. Uh, I think mm. That was a early 80s novel, I think. A uh, women's press novel. Uh, Joan Riley Unbelonging was just like really, really searing. It's a dark, you know, it's a heavy read. Very heavy read. I mean, it takes yeah. a lot to get through that book. She, she goes through a lot of the character, the, the main character and stuff. But uh, uh, it always stuck in my head, you know. It's a really powerful, uh, yeah, just like well-written book. I really enjoyed that. So just to, you know, put that out there for people, because that's one that's kind of slipped by the wayside. People don't talk about that very much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, so just before we end, I want to ask what you think... Um, no, where you think the Black British novel will be in terms of prevalent themes they will have in maybe like 20 years, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Like, what do you think everybody's going to be writing about? <laughs> I don't want to know. I, like, I don't even want to guess. <laughs> I hope it's something that I could never in my wildest dreams have imagined. That would be something. Mm. That like just like, Someone does something that is just so out there and new and fresh that I never considered it myself. I want to read that book. Um, so, so, and I hope there's lots of people doing that. But also, people continuing to develop the stuff that we've already got to and just pushing that further. So if you're going to be talking about identity, what is identity for someone 20 years down the line now when you've got generations of Black British people, you know? who, yeah, as far back as they, yeah. Yeah, the granddad and whatever, you know, they can remember they were born in this country, you know, would that be a possibility? Who knows where the way things are going, but, you know, um, yeah, I, I, that, that would be interesting too. I would just like to see more, um, and, and that's not to criticise what's happening now, because obviously there's all sorts of forces and reasons why things are the way they are now, but I would like to see, like, range. That for me would be really, then we're, we're really successful. It's, it's the range is just so wide that anything is possible for a black mm. writer. They can go anywhere they like, freedom. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, well, we'll wrap, we'll wrap up there. Um, thanks everybody for joining and listening to me and Corte ramble on about yeah, that really combo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, yeah, we appreciate you all for, uh, for joining, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Take care. <laughs>